just entered the theater of an alien sky. If the words and images seem strange to you, there's a reason for this. Our world was once a vastly different place. To experience this won't hurt you, and there is nothing to fear. In all of the discourses in this series, one question has dominated. The question concerns the monumental civilizations that emerged so suddenly and unpredictably just a few thousand years ago. As scientists and historians delve into the early cultures from ancient Egypt and Mesopotamia to China and the Americas, the greatest challenge is almost never addressed. How do we explain the mythic archetypes, the global patterns? As we've noted repeatedly in this series, not one of the early civilizations was free from this remarkable substructure of human thought. A profound sense of connection to the earliest remembered time, called the first time. A time of celestial splendor when visible gods ruled the heavens. A lost paradise or golden age on earth. A towering temple or city or kingdom in the sky. A celestial Heliopolis, Sumer, or Jerusalem. A model in heaven to inspire construction of sacred dwellings on earth. A cosmic mountain rising along the world axis as if to support the luminous dwelling of the gods. A primeval sun god at the summit. Not the body we call sun today but a power claimed to have ruled the sky in a former age of gods and wonders. Why did Greek chroniclers so consistently identify the celestial founder of the Golden Age as Kronos, the Latin planet god Saturn? And for what unearthly reason would Greek astronomers have also named this very power as Helios, the sun? It is all preposterous. And yet the collective memories still tug at us, calling us to remember, pointing to patterns of historical fact that challenge every common opinion today about the past. The archetypes are the permanent backdrop to every civilization on Earth. We know that all of the early cultures obsessively feared a fiery serpent or dragon whose attack on the world brought humanity to the edge of extinction. And how strange that storytellers everywhere knew also the story of a cosmic warrior rising to subdue that very monster. These are not just loosely defined expressions of human anxiety. As we've seen, the details are concrete and the parallels are worldwide. The pervasive theme of the attacking serpent or dragon must have an explanation. Mere accidents of human thought could never have achieved the global influence of this human memory. No intellectual mistake could be greater than ignoring this convergence of human memories. The remembered events are not occurring in our own time. Today's world, today's sky, could not have provoked a single mythic or symbolic archetype, and that's the heart of a profound mystery. The archetypal substructure exists and has been documented across hundreds of global themes. This can only mean that something fundamental and indispensable to scientific understanding has been overlooked. To follow this question into the heart of the ancient world, it's well worth considering one archetype in particular, taking us back to the first stirrings of the great civilizations. I'm referring here to the ancient mother goddess, in particular the polar opposites expressed in the goddess's underlying identity. How did a mythic archetype, a goddess revered as the source of life and light and feminine charm, come to display a darker aspect as a world-threatening monster, the prototype of the Wicked Queen. A goddess originally celebrated as the exemplary star, the beautiful Queen of Heaven. What could account for the transformation of that very goddess into a shrieking witch or hag whose wildly disordered streaming hair stretched across the sky? Cross-cultural comparison has answered the question. 
The paradoxical opposites take us back to one and the same power in the heavens. The love goddess and the terrible goddess turn out to be not just one and the same mythic figure, but one and the same planet, the planet Venus. In fact, the only planet amongst five visible planets to be given a feminine identity. Don't believe in accidents. That paradox has never been resolved and will not go away. It requires something yet to be recognized in standard treatments of the mother goddess. Just consider. The horrifying Medusa figure was a classic symbol of terror, but Greek historians and poets knew that Medusa was originally a form of stunning beauty. That's the paradox in a nutshell. And it traces to the very beginnings of civilization, where in ancient Mesopotamia we observed the transformation of the Sumerian love goddess Inanna into a shrieking dragon attacking the world. The same transformation occurs in ancient Egypt in the story titled The Destruction of Mankind. Here we see the beautiful goddess Sekhmet transformed into the fiery, world-threatening Uraeus serpent. How are we to explain this ancient paradox? Such unsolved mysteries invite us to question our assumptions. And one assumption in particular has held students of planetary history in its grip for well over a hundred years. That assumption began as a guess, and it remained just a guess across the 20th century and into the 21st century. The theoretical assumption proclaims, as today, so before. The present is the key to the past. Call it the uniformity principle. Nothing to see here. It just assumes that the positions and relative motions of the planets have remained constant for millions of years, even billions of years, some would say. Today, this uniformity principle is the greatest obstacle to discovery. It systematically precludes any understanding of our more ancient past. Even in the face of overwhelming evidence to the contrary, the uniformity principle deflects our attention away from the collective memories that drove the emergence of the early civilizations. No mistake could be more costly than to ignore the global consensus, the archetypal substructure beneath the surface details and contradictions of the archaic cultures. This substructure is a bedrock of cross-cultural agreement, and it requires us to consider events that are not occurring today. The uniformity principle cannot be valid in approaches to ancient history. Our purpose in this series is to show that every known mythic archetype finds its place in the emergence and catastrophic evolution of a gathering of planets close to the Earth no selective perception required. We've called this ancient planetary assembly the polar configuration. This gathering of planets was the centerpiece of the anciently remembered age of gods and wonders. Within this framework, the global imagery of the mother goddess connects us directly to the origins, the dynamic activity, and the ultimate fate of the Venus goddess. One planet alone meets the acid test, drawing our attention to the electrically discharging sphere seen visually in front of and close to the center of a much larger sphere named in the astronomical traditions as the planet Saturn. And within the very same context, the Venus goddess stood in a profound alignment with the smaller, darker, and reddish sphere named globally as the planet Mars, the prototype of the warrior hero. That's the mother goddess paradox that we will explore in the two episodes to follow.